Welcome so much to the Clements Bookworm. This is already our 19th episode. So thank you for supporting us in this way. I'm Angela Unk, Director of Development at the Clements Library. It seems, uh, oh, just one more thing. We will be recording this episode to share uh, online and also with you later. So you'll receive a, an email later this afternoon with a link to the recording and all of the resources discussed today. I see people joining in in the chat, so that's great. I just want to give you a quick tutorial. Uh, please chime in, continue to chime in in the chat. We love to have that feeling of camaraderie and discussion, even though we're so far apart. Try to select all panelists and attendees, please, so that we can all see the information. You'll see that it also goes by very quickly. So if you do have a specific question, please locate the Q and A section of the Zoom and put your questions in there. That will keep them in one location for us. You may also give it a little thumbs up if you see a question um, from someone else that you would also like answered and that will move it to the top of the queue. And if we type answers in, then you can see them posted there with the question. Or if you have maybe um, something additional about that question that you would like answered, go ahead and type it in that um, comment answer section. Or um, if you have a comment about the answer, about answering that question. Uh, both Anne and Tracy are on vacation today, so um, my colleague Jane Ptolemy is helping out on chat, so you'll see her posting some links and answering questions and keeping track of things in the chat. So thanks, Jane. This program is brought to you by the William L. Clements Library located on the campus of the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. The Clements Library enables the discovery, learning, and teaching of American history through the collections, conservation, digitization, and availability of primary sources on paper. So thank you so much for joining us today. Just maybe one more minute to quick click in your poll answers. Um, we, because we're talking about Courier and Ives today, we thought it might be fun to see what kinds of prints and paintings people display in their homes. I'm going to go ahead and end the polling and share the results. All right. Landscape is the, um, is the winner with 70% of people saying they have landscape paintings or prints displayed at their homes. Um, but portraiture, still life, uh, are close seconds, followed up by historical scenes and wildlife. So uh, thanks so much for participating. If, if you logged on early, you heard Clayton say that he clicked all of them. So he's well represented and I'm pretty sure that I probably have some of each at my house too. <laughs> Talked about our, our walls being thoroughly covered. All right. Today, I'd like to welcome Clayton Lewis and Stephanie Delamere, who will be discussing Fanny Palmer, the life and works of a career in Ives artist. Um, this is an exciting uh, program with a lot of great visuals. Um, Clayton oversees the Clements collections of historical prints, photographs, artwork, and illustrated sheet music and other visual materials at the Clements Library. He's authored numerous articles and has curated exhibits on vernacular photography, early racial satire, popular and patriotic music, wartime art, and American leisure travel. So thanks for joining us again on the book, Gordon Clayton. Happy to be here. Looking forward to this one. 
Great. Would you like to introduce our guest? Uh, yeah, I would, I would be honored to do so. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome to this week's Bookworm, Dr. Marie-Stephanie Delamar, Associate Curator of Fine Art from the Winter Tour Museum Garden and Library in Delaware. Dr. Delamar is a specialist in the study of 19th century American painting, printing technology, and the art market. She's published essays on antebellum American genre painting in relation to transatlantic expansion of the publishing industry and on 19th century American satire. Dr. Delamar teaches the fine art portion of the connoisseurship program at the Winter Tour Library. And among the organizations that have supported her research are the National Endowment for the Humanities, the Terra Foundation for American Art, the Smithsonian American Art Museum, the American Antiquarian Society, and the Library of Congress. Her current fields of interest include American portraiture, the materiality of 19th century print and visual culture, and transnational exchanges. Uh, Dr. Delamar has curated an exhibit on the artists and print of the art, artists of the print publishers Courier and Ives for Winter Tour back in 2016, and she's written several articles and book chapters on Fanny Palmer and the printing firm. She's the lead author of a forthcoming exhibition catalog, Revisiting America, The Prints of Courier and Ives, which is scheduled to open at the Jocelyn Art Museum in Omaha, Nebraska in October of this year. Uh, welcome, Stephanie. Nice to have you here. I'm so pleased to have both of you here. Thanks so much. Uh, maybe to kick us off, Clayton, would you tell us a little bit about the book that inspired today's discussion? Um, I'd be happy to. It's, uh, it's a terrific book, uh, The Life and Work of a Courier and Ives Artist, authored by Charlotte Rubenstein and edited by Diane Benty. And this was published with the support of the American Historical Print Collector Society, um, an organization that both Stephanie and I are actively involved in. Um, the book can be ordered from the Print Collector Society website. It can also be ordered from Syracuse University Press, the publishers. And uh, Stephanie and I, we first met at a meeting of the American Historical Print Collector Society. It's a wonderful organization. Um, it includes curators and collectors and general enthusiasts at all levels. And um, I'm very sorry that this year's annual meeting had to be canceled because they tend to be wonderful um, three to four day events with behind the scenes tours of museums and libraries, tremendous lectures by uh, top ranked speakers and, and a wonderful socializing with the membership. Um, um, uh, we will look forward to the chance to be doing more meetings perhaps next year. Um, if you're interested in joining, check out the American Historical Print Collector Society website for membership information. Um, and then Courier and Ives. Uh, we all have seen Courier and Ives prints in so many places, uh, on the walls of historic homes, in reproduction posters and calendars, holiday cards. They were the most prolific print publisher of the 19th century in America. Um, Stephanie, maybe you can tell us a little bit about how this firm got started and what, what it was that made them so popular. Yeah, um, thank, thank you, uh, Clayton, for the introduction and thank you uh, uh, for having me um, as part of the uh, virtual bookworm. It's really exciting to be here. Um, yeah, so Curia and I, uh, for me, is really representative of 19th century America. I guess it's because it's a firm that uh, dominated so much uh, the, um, uh, the production of pictures uh, during the period. They were founded in uh, 1834 by Nathaniel Currier, whom you see on the left. And um, they uh, basically went out of business in the uh, first decade of the 20th century. And they published uh, thousands and thousands, or I would say hundreds of thousands of images throughout the period. And they really, um, I think um, we, we associate them with 19th century America because they were so uh, powerful in terms of their ability to publish 
um, all different kinds of images, like portraits, uh, cart political port uh, polit portraits of people, uh, political figures, uh, actors, um, political cartoons, social cartoons, landscape, uh, genre scenes. I mean, basically every, um, even like uh, religious um, uh, figures, everything that uh, people might have wanted uh, on their wall. And they also published them in a wide variety of uh, formats and prices. So they called themselves um, uh, the publishers of uh, uh, cheap and popular pictures. Uh, and uh, we think of them basically as a commercial enterprise, but as uh, when we uh, go on talking about Fanny Palmer, I, um, I think we'll uh, realize that they were also publishing very high quality images of the kind that I, I have as a, as a screen on the back. Um, so this is, a, this is a picture of the, um, um, uh, the, um, uh, the, the, the picture that basically transformed the firm from a uh, regular early 19, I mean, 1830s job printing firm into uh, this uh, gigantic book, uh, print publisher who uh, dominated the market for like 75 years. Um, so it's the uh, conflagration of the Lexington. The Lexington was the, um, uh, was a steamboat that was um, going from New York City to uh, Stonington in Connecticut. And in January of 1840, uh, it caught fire. And basically, it was a catastrophe. Uh, there was only four survivors. Um, and it was such a, uh, such a disaster that the, uh, um, the, the press, uh, um, the press, um, uh, uh, made a contract with different lithographers, actually. It was not Courier, uh, Nathaniel Courier that was the first, uh, to, uh, to represent the, um, um, the event. But um, within like, within a, a week, uh, there was like 12,000 uh, copies of that uh, print uh, sold on the market. And um, which at the time, I mean, it's still huge today, if you think about it. I mean, it's extraordinary. Uh, and it showed the appetite for images, right? Um, 12,000, like considering the fact I was looking uh, uh, at numbers, I was thinking about like, you know, what kind of impact could it have on the printing industry at the time? Like a good lithographic printer at the time could print about 300, um, 300 images a day. So within a week, if you have 12,000 images, it's a huge amount of pressmen and uh, presses that you need. So basically I think that the event really showed uh, Nathaniel that he could um, that there was a market for images that instead of basically responding to demand, he could propose images on the market and uh, get a huge uh, boost for his firm for it. And that's what happened. And so these are, these are images that I thought are for me at least quintessentially uh, Korean eyes and quintessentially uh, 19th century America, especially like the life of a fireman. They, uh, as I said, they were really producing uh, all different kinds of images and images that would really represent um, what, or what the, uh, the firm thought, let's say, Americans wanted and also uh, what they actually, uh, uh, what uh, the um, uh, epic of 19th century America with Western expansion, the steam engine, um, and uh, like, you know, like with the sporting scenes, it's sort of like the importance of the encounter with the wilderness and proving uh, one's uh, ability to overcome the, the wild forces uh, that remained there in America in the 19th century. And their images were so widely disseminated that uh, they even, uh, uh, they really represent, were disseminated also in Europe, I don't know, uh, I know that, for example, like the, the painter Dali uh, had a collection of Korean knife prints, and then he, in some of his surrealist paintings, he, uh, uh, he took like a very famous Korean knife scene and transformed them in, in a very interesting ways. So I think of uh, Courier knives as responding to market demand, but at some point they became so popular that they were 
they were shaping what the market wanted based on what they were producing. Do you think that that, that, that happened? I think it probably was a, a little bit of a back and forth. Um, so, um, like in the case of the conflagration of the Lexington, I think it was an eye opener event uh, for them. Um, and uh, and then they uh, created this uh, policy where they hired uh, artists to uh, create images, and so I, it's. Kind of difficult to know there's very little archive so it's very difficult to know if the artist had the opportunity to propose their subject or if or if it's Korean, uh, Nathaniel Curie who said I wanted I want an image on this what can you what can you do um, but and then so they had the this huge factory on in the lower Manhattan um, if we get back to the map yeah so I, I uh, in this image I um, I wanted to situate them a little bit in the printing industry of the 19th century and the art industry as well. So we have uh, the stars that are um, the uh, places where the place where Korean eyes uh, shop and factory was. It was a huge factory. It was like taking three stories in a five story building. Um, and every different story had like specific function in the production of the of the prints. Uh, another star that by well, can talk about it later is um, where Fanny Palmer's first firm was in New York. Um, and then like the squares are uh, Frank Leslie's uh, illustrated newspaper um, in the, at the uh, bottom triangular uh, space of the park and Harper's also, the house of Harper's to the right, to the east. And then on, uh, at the, um, upper, on the upper uh, section of that square, you see three dots which are like uh, which are uh, fine arts institutions, like National Academy of Design, and also um, uh, other dealers of, of, print, of uh, printed images, like Goupil and Company, who settled in New York in 1848. So really, like in, in this very relatively small part of Manhattan, uh, you had a huge amount of um, uh, publish, like very important publishing houses, also fine arts institutions, uh, that were sort of supporting each other in some ways, right? So I think that there was an appetite for um, for print. There was there was a demand, a high demand uh, for uh, colorful images uh, to put in one's home. But also, I think uh, there were the institutions uh, that could support uh, that industry by training artists, uh, because there was a huge amount of artists too. Um, was Fanny Palmer part of that factory scene? Um, actually, so that's a bit of a mystery, <laughs> as is a bit uh, Fanny Palmer, right? Like Fanny Palmer is a, a super interesting uh, person for me. Uh, she, so she's an immigrant in uh, 1844 in New York. She's from uh, Britain. She was born in Leicester in Britain. Um, and uh, she arrived in New York in 1844 uh, with her husband, uh, Edmund Seymour Palmer. And they first set up a firm, a lithographic firm, uh, like a couple of blocks away from uh, Courier. And um, so there was a couple of, I mean, the, the way that, um, uh, Fanny Palmer's story has uh, surfaced recently is really thanks to the work of uh, Charlotte Rubinstein. Um, she, she tracked down all the print that she could find that had a uh, Palmer uh, signature. And she uncovered a huge production uh, before, uh, before she started working for Korean Eyes. And uh, so what do we know? We, like, we have very, very few uh, direct primary resources. Uh, we have the print themselves uh, that are beautifully cataloged in the book. And then we have one interview that she gave in, about, in the early 1860s um, to Virginia Penny, who was writing a book about employment for women. And so the quote uh, that we have on the screen, one must have the talent of an artist and a great practice with a pencil. I thought, for me, really, I mean, is a, um, she talks about it as if it was uh, just a general statement, but I think it, uh, I, I really agree with Charlotte that it must reflect what she was thinking about her, uh, her work uh, and her career. 
so uh, we have uh, within this interview there are a few hints here and there that I think really indicate that she was not actually working in the factory as uh, most people thought before um, I think partly because when so there's a great book uh, by Harry Peters uh, published in the 1930s which is really uh, launched the uh, interest at the time um, in uh, the production of Korean knives um, and it was written in the 1930s, right, with a bias that, uh, against women and their uh, ab basic ability to be creative uh, was at the time. So I don't think Harry Peters could imagine really that she was um, in charge of her own workshop. Um, but when we get back to when we get back to the interviews that were conducted um, at the time uh, uh, in the 1920s, um, and that those interviews are um, in the papers of Harry, Harriet uh, Endicott Waite in the Archives of American Art. So when we get back to those interviews, we realize that actually um, she must have been working not in the factory, but in her own studio in, in Brooklyn, where she lived, um, which is supported also by the census records, uh, and that interview, because in the interview, she also mentioned that she taught uh, people um, and that uh, she uh, basically she had a, a course of like an apprentice uh, system set up. And then sometimes she paid um, the artist whom she was teaching. Um, and uh, so basically, when you were working in the factory, if you look into the other interviews where you were looking, working in the factory, there was no way your salary would allow you to do. Uh, that sort of stuff. Like um, there is another artist who was uh, born in Germany and who worked for Korean Knife as an independent artist. And in these interviews, he's describing the system, which is totally corresponds to what we see in the Virginia Penny interview as well. So I think that she was basically the head of a workshop in Brooklyn. And uh, her main, um, uh, she was basically working 99% of the time for Korean eyes because uh, Charlotte was able to find only one print uh, during this whole period she worked for Korean eyes that was not um, done for Korean eyes. So this also uh, across the continent, uh, this is probably one of our most famous uh, print. It really shows uh, well, it's of, of course an embodiment of 19th century American Western expansion. Uh, it's also the print, for example, like that's the first print by, by Fanny Palmer that I ever encountered, uh, which makes me think it's so interesting because she was probably the most productive 19th century Amer uh, American woman artist whose work ended up on most American homes and yet she's still relatively unknown, right? She's definitely, I mean, I don't think she's a household name. Um, whereas like Curry and I might be, um, but, uh, and this is a print that I encountered first, uh, in my, uh, American art survey, uh, when, uh, when I went to graduate school in New York, uh, and that's my, the, the first time I encountered her work. And it's such an iconic image, totally representative, both of think of, of Curry and I, and that's, of that's so interesting that you uh, saw this in an American art survey, which would probably not have included much in the way of, of vernacular prints, I would guess. Is, is that true? Um, so that's sort of the, yes, um, in a sense that usually Korean-ized prints are not considered fine art, right? They are uh, ve very much seen as, um, as popular culture and, uh, and, and as I said, cheap commercial images. I mean, it was a commercial enterprise, no doubt about that. Uh, but I think these kind of images that are very large um, were actually much more, like they, they required a significant, let's say, uh, expense. Like, uh, so you need, like it's not, it was not, not anybody could have uh, a print like that in their homes. Um, so when I was at, uh, when I was preparing this exhibition that you mentioned at, for the Winterton Museum in 2015, um, we're lucky at the Winterthur Museum to have a to have a full conservation lab and also a full uh, scientific lab. So I wanted to take advantage of this opportunity and um, 
we, we did some uh, analysis of uh, the materials involved uh, in the, uh, in the large, the, the so-called large folios, Korean knives prints are classified according to their sizes and the larger ones are called the large folios. And so we did a, a lot of analysis of the pigments, the papers, um, and we found that the materials used are definitely not cheap. Um, so, uh, so for me, uh, this is really a high-end product. Um, and of course, the, I mean, the, the way that the perspective is drawn with this train going forward also uh, makes me think of uh, some of the most other iconic pictures that Fanny Palmer drew, which are like very much about the steam engine, uh, races, uh, the power of the machine. Um, so if we move maybe one, yeah, that, that kind of uh, images, like a race for the buckhorn, which is um, uh, this print, which is unfortunately, unfortunately not <laughs> in the collection of the Winter Tour Museum. Um, it's, a, it's a really beautiful print. Um, and you can sense the, uh, the sense of excitement, uh, this one too, uh, the Lightning Express trains. Uh, with nocturns, nocturnal scenes and very strong diagonals. And um, I don't know if Fanny uh, Palmer ever uh, traveled west of New York City. I mean, we have the, what's uh, in, the, in the stories that we, we have from the, from the published material says that she didn't. I, I really don't know. Like, I don't, I don't know whether we can really know one way or another. Um, and so I, I guess that if she didn't travel west, she must have found her sources in uh, images that were published in newspapers um, or in uh, photographs. Uh, but she was really able to give them a sense of energy, uh, epic, uh, that so represents the 19th century uh, Victorian era in America. Um, you know, it's also interesting that she, what she's representing um, to us, this is, you know, old fashioned railroads, but at the time, this was the latest technology that she was depicting. Um, and it was exciting because it was new as well, I would think. Yeah, I think it was, uh, it was new. It was, and it's interesting uh, um, in a sense that we don't necessarily imagine uh, that kind of representation associated with a woman artist as well, right? Uh, we think more of um, uh, domestic scenes, uh, maybe still lives, like the one I have in the, uh, in the back. Um, but I think this was an interest of hers. Um, and I, like in, uh, of course, uh, in the, um, Sporting scenes also is something that she uh, she did very often, and I so this I really like this series a lot. This is a series that she did uh, in 1852 uh, for uh, Nathaniel Courier, and um, the series is bigger than those two prints. But these are some of the like nicer, comp I mean, nicest composition, and I like them particularly because of the way that. Uh, she inscribed herself in, um, in the images. I mean, so she wrote on all the stones um, from nature and on stone by uh, F, uh, F. F. Palmer. And uh, so she really insists that she was there on the spot, um, which is a, a way that other artists, uh, lithographer at the time, uh, not necessarily all the time, but uh, Basically, she, want, she wanted to say that she drew the composition and she drew the stone, which is actually the kind of uh, uh, creativity and uh, career that was not an, uh, the best, very typical of a uh, um, of Victorian woman. And the one on the right is also um, particularly nice because of she, she also wrote uh, that the dogs uh, belong to her husband. So um, we know that her husband uh, was trained with her. I mean, um, was trained with her. That's my assumption, actually. But we know that he was trained as a lithographic printer. Um, and I assume that they got trained together uh, since they were married before, um, before they 
before they actually uh, got trained in the in the in the uh, in this uh, craft. So uh, he has a bad reputation. <laughs> he has the reputation of being an alcoholic, basically, and uh, that uh, we we know that their firm, the firm they established in New York, failed around uh, 1849, 1850. And then uh, she started working for Curia and Ives, probably almost exclusively. Um, and then he became a tavern keeper. And I guess that's also uh, where, that, uh, let's say, how it sustains the idea that he was uh, more of a person who uh, liked to go um, uh, to have a bit too much to drink, uh, and that he died in uh, falling on falling in the stairway uh, because of alcohol. Um, but uh, I, in a scene like that in 1852, and basically I, I can imagine um, uh, Palmer and her husband uh, going. She basically accompanied them on um, on those hunting trips and uh, created these beautiful I mean, hunting and fishing trips uh, and created these beautiful images. I partic like the one on the left particularly has this very, very nice and delicate uh, line for the fishing line that um, if we get to the next slide, um, you see like how the fishing line is this very, very tiny white line. And it's basically just a uh, stroke with an etching needle on the stone directly. Um, so it's very simple, very economical, uh, but it's so uh, efficient uh, to represent what it is, right? So she was a very talented artist. And this is another, so this, let's say for me, is the kind of, uh, um, the kind of images that we could associate much more with a Victorian womanhood, right? And so she, it's another series that uh, Curia and I have commissioned um, of her. Uh, it's called American Country, uh, Country Life, and there's a series of them. This one is, I think it's for the, uh, for the fall, representing the season at the same time. And um, it's such a, uh, uh, such a, uh, beautiful picture of domestic happiness, uh, wealth. Um, I would see. I would also point out how well she has rendered the architecture. Mm -hmm. In addition to the landscape, she is very confident with the man-made structures in general. But but the architecture is beautifully done. True, and I think that it goes back to her education. Um, to she had the. Um, she was she was raised in an upper middle class family in uh, in Leicester in England, and um, she uh, she was sent to an academy for girls, uh, you know, which is not in itself nothing extraordinary. Uh, but the academy uh, where she studied was extraordinary, and it's something that um, all of this uh, uh, knowledge really uh, owe it to Charlotte's book and how she uh, digged into the early, um, she, she went to, the, to uh, uh, the archives in England to figure out, you know, there was different, we could say rumors almost, <laughs> legends, let's say, about her education. And she really uh, found the, um, the, the facts. So she actually, so the headmistress of this academy where she was uh, educated, was Mary Linwood, whom you see on the left here. And Mary Linwood was not any uh, uh, headmistress. First, uh, she had a super long life. I mean, she died at age 90. <laughs> uh, and, but she was an artist herself, like a professional artist who uh, her specialty had nothing to do with lithography, obviously, but it, her specialty was needle uh, pictures. She was, um, she was recreating masterpieces in needlework with irregular stitches that imitated, like that really rendered the, the idea of a brushstroke. And she was so popular that she had her own permanent exhibition on Leicester Square in London. And uh, let's say all the uh, royal families of Europe wanted to have uh, pictures by her. But then, and then she was also the headmistress of um, this uh, girl academy in Leicester. So first of all, I'm thinking, 
she, uh, she was educated in an academy um, directed by a woman who had a professional career herself. So I'm thinking that when Palmer um, thought about possibilities, she had this great example. Uh, because it's important not only to have the talent, but to have the imagination to be able to, um, especially in a society that really is, in a society and a social class that really wants to see women's place as the uh, domestic sphere, right? Um, you have to be able to imagine yourself in another situation. And I do think that Mary Linwood must have played a role in Fanny's decision and ability to take on that role as well. Um, so, and uh, um, Louis Ag that you see on the, uh, on the right um, is the place where she and I think her husband uh, got trained in lithography. Uh, so, the, what, as far as we know, um, so Fanny Palmer was raised in this upper middle class family um, where it was not thought that a woman would have to make a living. Uh, but her father uh, died uh, without a will and in a lot of debt. So I think all the family money went at that time. And uh, Palmer and her husband, so Palmer had been married for already like seven years at that time. Um, she, uh, she and her husband decided to set themselves up in an artistic trade, uh, lithography. And I think most likely, I imagine they both went. Uh, so we know that she was trained by Louis Ag because she, in that interview to Virginia Penny that, uh, uh, that we have, she said that she was trained by someone who'd lost three fingers um, in his right hand. And the only person, and therefore was drawing with his left hand. And the only person, the only lithographer that we know in London who uh, corresponds to that profile is the Louis Ag. And Louis Ag was not any uh, lithographer. He was, um, he was of the firm Day and Hag. Um, he, he was the best. He was, yeah. he was at the top. Exactly. He was the lithographer to the queen. He was a very, he was a very respected and famous watercolorist. Uh, and he was an artist. So firms were very often created by an artist uh, lithographer and a uh, printer. And so he was the artist. And this is the kind of uh, work that he did in that period. Uh, it's uh, one of the um, uh, lithographs published for David Roberts' um, travels to uh, the Holy Land and Egypt uh, that the firm produced. It's highly, uh, the highest end of lithography you can find at the time. Um, it's high-end publication, very expensive. It's, um, it's, what, it's a mix of what's called crayon lithography and uh, tint lithography. And tint lithography was uh, the technique that was um, developed during that period really to, to publish um, images that felt like wa uh, watercolor washes um, drawing, right? Uh, and, and that's basically, that, that was uh, published, I think in 1842. Um, or like the early 1840s. So I think that it was probably in the works when uh, she was in the, um, uh, when she was in London being trained. And when you look at the earliest uh, um, lithograph that she published in New York, you realize that she, uh, she absorbed a lot of uh, this, uh, this technique. So for example, that this one is a, um, a lithography, a lithograph that she published in 1844 in New York. We don't know exactly when she arrived in New York, but really it's like one of the first things that she did, she and her husband did. Um, so to go back to your point about architecture, um, it's the um, Church of the Holy Trinity in Brooklyn, and you can see how refined her uh, architectural drawing is. Um, so when uh, architecture drawing was very important uh, in lithography. It was one of it, uh, many publications um, used the technique at the time uh, to publish architectural drawing. And if you, I think, go to the next slide, I have, um, no, uh, the next one, I think. Yes. Um, and this is a book that she published also um, uh, that same year. It's um, 
it's called The Architect. It's a several uh, volume uh, publication that has all the architectural, architectural drawing, uh, plans, uh, elevations. Uh, and uh, basically at this time, I don't think that they, I mean, I, I have no idea exactly how big their workshop was, but it's a huge endeavor. And uh, she, she did it all at, uh, um, in this very early period. So if we go back <laughs> uh, to the other images, uh, we see in both cases that she's using, so it's, it's not a chromo lithograph that we, we could think of because it's not, um, chromo lithographs are uh, lithographs that are printed with uh, a wide variety of colors. So these are called tint lithograph, lithograph because they use several stones, but two and three, generally not much more. And um, you have uh, different kinds of ink and different kinds of polish used on the stone. So for example, here you have the, um, the steeple of the church that's printed with two colors and two stones that are um, relatively, like the image is relatively grainy, it evokes chalk. Uh, so they are like uh, done with lithographic crayon of different uh, hardness to, uh, and sometimes also uh, a pe like a, a, um, a very um, uh, a pen and uh, with a very fine uh, uh, liquid ink. I mean, not ink, uh, lithographic ink, which is uh, called touche, uh, to to make very fine lines. And then the texture of the church is done with this um, lithographic crayon, which gives it a very much of a stone effect. But the sky itself is printed on a completely different kinds of, the kind of stone, something that, a stone that's gonna be much more polished, um, so that it has, it doesn't, it's not gonna give this grainy effect to evoke the, to create this more like wash. Um, and then she's gonna, uh, so you need like a, a transparent ink to do that as well, so it's a different kind of uh, of ink. And then for, for the for the sky, she's going to uh, rub the stone or use um, uh, what's called a stop out, where you 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 put another uh, a kind of um, varnishing area so that the ink is not gonna is not gonna print and uh, superpose together like the to the three stones that you have uh, gives you this very delicate uh, atmospheric effect for the sky and uh, um, and beautiful architectural drawing for the steeple. I remember you showed us this print when we had our Clements Library trip to winter tour last fall and I was absolutely stunned by how beautiful it was and one of the things that struck me is um, American lithography at the time was quite primitive compared to European lithography. And this print, which was published in America, was technically beyond what almost any other American lithographer was capable of. And it was certainly superior to what Courier was doing at the same time. Um, that, that just struck me as really remarkable. Yeah, I think that, um... I, I think she was. I think she was bringing to uh, to New York basically the what was the newest and and the best uh, in lithographic technique at the time, and um, I'm sure it was not lost on uh, on Nathaniel Curie's eyes. Right, Nathaniel Curie was trained as a lithographer in Boston in one of the first uh, shops. Uh, who, uh, who had imported the press, pressmen and material uh, from France, actually. Um, and uh, she, uh, I think she had um, a more, um, more, ex more extensive uh, knowledge. She and her husband, again, like I'm still bringing the husband in there because you do need a fine printer to get uh, to get to a, a very fine image, like the one you have. One of the tricks, let's say, in uh, tint lithography, it's not only you need to master the materials. Um, lithography is kind of a simple thing in some, I mean, simple things. It looks simple on the, uh, on the outset, right? It's the idea, it's the idea that oil and water uh, based media cannot mix. So it's like salad dressing. If you put, uh, you know, your vinegar and the oil, they're always going to separate. 
Um, so the principle of it is that you're going to draw directly on the stone, on a prepared stone with an oil me oily medium, a greasy medium, like a specifically prepared crayon or specifically prepared ink. And then um, you're going to do like a slight edge on the, on the, on the stone to fix the image on the stone. And then you'll, water, you'll wash it with water and then roll uh, oil based ink as well on the stone and then you know the idea is that your your oil based ink on the roller and the oil based drawing on the stone will only stick together and the water will repel everybody uh, everything else but in fact so that's the principle and that's quite easy to understand um i've tried once uh lithography <laughs> i've tried my talent at lithography and i can tell you right away that i'm not very gifted in this medium, it's actually really hard because uh, um, I didn't try it on stone, but stone and um, already I didn't try it on stone and it's really hard, but stone is actually like limestone. So you have to have very specific type of stone. It's a limestone and the, the stones were actually coming from Bavaria. So I also imagine always all these ships. I don't, I mean, no, America must have imported a huge amount of stones because they were trying to find an equivalent stone in the US and really the best stones were coming from Bavaria. So there must have been a huge uh, uh, import of this very, this very heavy material. So uh, it's a very, very sensitive um, material. So, and let's say, you know, uh, your fingers have a little bit, like, we, like our skin produce uh, oil, right? So you touch, the, uh, you touch the stone with your finger and you'll have a mark. Um, so it's a, it's actually a very difficult uh, medium. And the first uh, printers who developed the printing technique wrote treatises to entice artists and to explain to them how, like, you know, how you do you get to get a good image. And Nathaniel Curie was able to produce very uh, decent images, uh, you know, if you look at the early production. Um, but I do think that uh, Fanny, uh, Fanny Palmer had, um, had learned uh, techniques that he didn't know anything about. And when you, in particular, that tint lithography technique and uh, the ability to print those different stones perfectly aligned. So otherwise your image is completely off, right? Um, if, you, um, if you have your black drawing that's uh, slightly to the side, then you can't, you know, it's like when you have your ink, uh, inkjet printer that's not working properly, and then your image is all cued and you can't see anything. Um, so the printing technique and the the, the uses of the material the uses of the materials on the stones are very uh, tricky. Um, so this is another this is a, a like a some one of my favorite prints the one you have on the on the right uh, called Forget Me Not. It's definitely one of my favorite prints by Fanny Palmer. That's from that early period. Um, doesn't look like uh, much like necessarily, uh, it's, not, it's not as refined, let's say, than, as the one that uh, we just saw uh, with the Trinity Church uh, lithograph. But um, it's a super interesting publication. It's, uh, so it, it all goes back to a book published in uh, 1847 in Paris called Les Fleurs Animées, which means um, it's the, it was translated in English right away and published in America as uh, Flowers Personified. And it's very, Victorian uh, publication where you have a poem and, and a woman whose personification of a flower on every, uh, um, illustrating every single poem. And the images are, um, yeah, they, they make me think of Alice in Wonderland in some ways. Uh, they're very um, fun, to, fun to look at. Um, and so what uh, Fanny Palmer was involved in is in this sort of like, uh, pirate uh, copy <laughs> of, the, of the Granville book um, that was done by a publisher in New York. But it's not exactly a copy. It was, it was a series of autograph albums, uh, which included, uh, I don't remember how many, maybe between five and 10, let's say, uh, illustrations, all taken from Granville um, and in randomly uh, put in the album without the poems. It was really just the images. Um, and so the one you have on the right, I think is really cool because you see, you know, at first when you, you look at it like that, it doesn't look like she's doing, um, yeah, it looks pretty much like a copy, but if you start looking in the background, you see 
the uh, steam uh, the steamboat and uh, it's really an American steamboat um, it's the uh, especially you know with the I think it's called the walking beam uh, that goes up and down and that's the kind of ship you could, I mean I looked, I do not know much about steamboats of the mid 19th century in New York, but I did uh, do a little bit of research at the time. And I think it's almost possible to identify which boat it is, um, or at least which company was producing this type of boat at the time. Um, and it's very typical American boat. So I'm like, you know, this is, and when you look, if we go back to the one slide and look at the other, uh, the original, uh, it doesn't even look like a steamboat. It looks more, a bit more like a, some sort of factory maybe on the, on the side of a river. And then really you see how it's the background, but that's where she inscribed what she was looking at, right? And uh, it's not, uh, let's say, just a regular copy of a composition. I mean, she could have just copied everything and, and that's that. But it shows you what she was looking at and she was interested in technology. She was interested in transportation. And it, so for me, it brings us back to the uh, later uh, large pictures she was doing for Kearney and Ice with uh, the steamboat races on the Mississippi, um, uh, the American Express train uh, or like the Lightning Express train. And again, we don't know, right? Was it Kearney and I asking her to do that? Or was she particularly interested in this kind of stuff? And she was saying, you know, I would like to draw, uh, I would like to draw something like that, uh, which is wooding up on the Mississippi again, one of those night scenes, strong diagonals, energy, fire, um, uh, the uh, uh, the newest and fastest boat, right? So I don't know, but I think it's uh, it's an interesting question to ask, right? Um, and so this is a, so what you had before was the, um, the, uh, colored version. Korean knives rarely produced fully colored printed images. So they rarely produced what's called chromolithographs, right? Where every single color is a different stone. Most of the time they produced, um, print, um, so, you know, a uh, lithograph printed with one or two or maximum three stones when there's a tin stone in particular. And, uh, and then it were colored by hand. Uh, so what you see here is the uh, version that's colored by hand. And if we go to the next slide, we see a, a non-colored copy that's at the Library of Congress. Um, I think that was sent by, for uh, copyright registration purposes. Um, and because, you know, Korean Ive then would not want to send, a, they didn't, for copyright purposes, you don't need to send a colored version that's more expensive. You don't need the expense for that. So they, they sent black uh, printed images. And that's where you see, so this is a two stone um, image. And um, you see that there is a, a very dark black in the cloud that's closest to us. And that's a, um, and it has texture in like a, more like a grainy texture. And it's, so that's a crayon drawing. And then what you have in the moonlight uh, with the cloud is a much more painterly effect uh, that she worked on with a tin stone. Um, and uh, so she worked with different tools to, um, uh, to get to all these gradations of grays. Uh, and there are areas where she probably, and it's very painterly, so I'm guessing that she, uh, it's not necessarily scratched on the stone, uh, but it's more like rubbed out, um, or maybe using um, um, a mezzotint tool um, to, uh, um, and the name escapes me right now, but it's um, basically to, you polish um, the, uh, the stone to get, uh, to get less of a texture. And then uh, you, um, when you look at it very closely, you get this uh, uh, very uh, uh, wide variations of grays uh, in the sky. And so that's just with two stones and black ink, basically, that you get that. And it's really uh, pretty cool. Stephanie, you're, you're, this is so engaging and so wonderful. Um, 
I'm, but I do want to skip us ahead a couple mm -hmm. of slides so we can wrap up because we already have a lot of questions, um, if that's all right. That's totally right. So it is really intriguing. I hope that's what you're thinking, Angela. I know. I didn't realize how late it was. So <laughs> I was like, oh, oh yes, oh. I see. <laughs> yeah. Oh, this well, is I like Fanny Palmer so much that uh, I can talk about her forever. So <laughs> oh, it's amazing. Um, can we get even, uh, uh, can I see what's next actually? Ah, uh, yeah. So, um, so I, w one of the things that this, after uh, reading uh, Charlotte's book, one of the things that I started thinking was that, okay, so I, I thought about her as being this um, um, woman at the head of a, uh, of a workshop in Brooklyn. And she mentions also in this interview that she only taught men. Uh, so she never had a woman uh, uh, artist in, uh, in her studio. And uh, well, I, I'm, I was thinking there must be so many people who must have been taught by her that we don't know anything about. Um, and I do not remember exactly how I started thinking about James Ives. Uh, maybe because I read this article in Imprint, which is the um, uh, journal published by the American Historical um, Collector Society, and uh, about James Ives and how they, there's a document that was found that uh, proved that he'd been working for Korean Ives much earlier than we thought. It was just a little receipt. It's amazing how things can come up like that because you find a, a document. So it's a receipt signed by him uh, in 1845, indicating that he was probably selling prints in, um, in the shop as early as 1845. It's in 1857 that he became the partner and then uh, Curry and Ives became, so like we keep thinking about the name as Curry and Ives, but in fact, so he comes in, he's a partner in uh, 1857. So I started thinking, well, uh, also, the, the legend would have it that he was a self -taught, a kind of a self-taught artist. And definitely, we find his signature sometimes in a few, not many, but a few prints from the 1860s. And I thought to myself, well, you know, you can't really be self-taught in lithography. It's like it's not an easy medium. And so I looked in the census and I traced him in Brooklyn. Turns out that uh, in 1845 and 1850, Oh, in 1850, in the 1850 census, he's listed as a print seller, but in 1855, he's listed as a lithographer. And then if you look at where Fanny Palmer and him were living, they were living in Brooklyn in exactly the same area all this time, in a, a few blocks away from each other. So basically, I'm putting it out there, but I think it's very likely that he got trained in her, um, uh, in her shop. Because I'm thinking, she was the best lithographer you could find that was working for Korean Ives at the time. And he was living in Brooklyn, very conveniently, a few blocks from her. And he was, and obviously he was very much trained. But again, in, in the historiography later, it's not necessarily easy or like it, it, it doesn't fit, let's say, stereotypes about gender in the 19th century, right? And one of the things that was really cool when, so I, I first, uh, read uh, Charlotte's book um, as a manuscript before publication and I want to thank John Zach of the American Historical Print Collector Society for lending this to me as I was preparing this exhibition in 2015. And when I read Diane Bente's introduction um, in, the, in the current book, like in the final uh, book, because um, the book was pretty much unfinished, so really Diane uh, uh, did a tremendous job um, editing the book and giving it uh, current uh, form. And in the introduction, she found a, a manuscript in New York saying that uh, John Knapp, one of the future partners of Sarony and Knapp, and who also would be one of the founders of the American Lithography Company, uh, was actually trained by Palmer. And I was like, yes, this is so cool. You know, once, like we know, one very important lithographer was actually trained in a workshop. That is cool. Thank you. Um, any any last comments before we head on to the questions? I think we can head on to the questions. Oh okay. yes, <laughs> uh, we could we could go all day because there's yeah. so many dimensions to her career, and, so uh, and, and some of this will come up in the questions. I'm sure. Oh, I think sure. so. I think so. 
So just to remind everyone, put your questions in the Q&A section and you can also upvote questions there by putting the thumbs up. I just want to um, remind you about next week. If you're new to the bookworm, you will receive a reminder um, an hour before the bookworm every week about the upcoming episode. And you'll also receive on Friday afternoons the recording and any resources shared during that episode. So you can look forward to that later today. Next week, we are hosting uh, author Daniel Livesay for a conversation about his book, The Children of Uncertain Fortune, Mixed Race Jamaicans in Britain and the Atlantic Family, 1733 to 1833. Um, this book examines the migration of elite Jamaicans of color to Britain and the intersections of race and family during the long 18th century. So that should be a really interesting discussion. So join us again next week. Um, if you enjoy the bookworm, of course, we uh, are always looking for sponsors for the bookworm and um, you can always email me about that. Uh, you can make a gift to the Clemens Library to help support these online programs during this interesting time in our world. So we appreciate you supporting us through watching and if possible through gifts. So thank you so much. All right, time for questions. All right, it looks like we've got our first candidate from Jane. Uh, were there other female artists also producing images of masculine subjects or was Palmer exceptional in that sense? Oh, I think it's a, it's a great question. There were other, uh, so there were other women artists and there were other women lithographers um, in America. Uh, they were definitely not as prolific as her. And uh, when I think about the images, I think uh, I do not, I, when I think about the images that I know, and I would love to hear more, like if you, if you know of any uh, uh, woman who was producing things like Palmer, I'm thinking also of that Battle of Buena Vista that we saw in passing very <laughs> uh, quickly. Um, I don't think so. I think she was exceptional in that sense. Uh, well, but again, right, if there is somebody that I don't know about, I would love to know. It's the kind of stuff, uh, it changes your way of looking at a society at a certain time, right? Is it safe to say that in the 19th century, many artists were subject specialists? They were good at horses or they were landscape artists or they were maritime artists. But Palmer was remarkable in that she could cover a very wide range of subjects. Some of them would be considered masculine and some of them not, but she was seemed to be equally adept at all of them. True, actually. And because she also did maritime, I'm thinking of um, uh, the other artists, like for example, Tate, um, Arthur Tate was producing a lot of paintings that would turn into a Korean I've seen, but he was really much of a specialist of uh, sporting scenes, uh, still lives, um, or, um, you know, or, or like, it was an animal painter, uh, basically, whereas she, she did that too. <laughs> but she could also do uh, maritime scenes as well, uh, which then, you know, there is another artist who was working for Curian and who was doing a lot of maritime scenes. Or you had another one who was doing genre scene, but, and, but as she was doing it all. Um, yeah. So, um, I don't know if you mentioned how many people she trained, but it was a lot, right? Well, I, we don't know, but let's say we, if we think about, uh, so she produced about 200 um, large images for Korean knives uh, over a period of, well, she started really in, let's say, 1850 and the last known, last known dated print is 1868. Did I say 1750? I might have. No, 1850, 1868. So it's like a couple of decades. Um, I imagine she constantly had uh, people in her studio. So that, we don't know, right? But that must have been um, 
a lot of people in the end. And I, I'm hoping that, you know, if we start thinking about it, we will find more evidence, such as the one that Diane Venti uh, found in New York. Uh, but we need to look for them, right? Right. And, and um, the people that she was training were all men, correct? All men, yeah. No women, even though so uh, I've heard about a couple of women who are also doing uh, lithography in Philadelphia, um, but not to the extent of Fanny Palmer. I must say. Thank you. Um, a very masculine field. So Tom is asking, were Carrier and Ives prints created primarily as documentation of contemporary events or as nostalgic documents? Ah, that's an interesting question. I think both. For example, uh, really like uh, what I, we could consider disaster prints uh, were contemporary events uh, that struck the imagination of the public at the time and that people wanted, even if they la lived very far away, they wanted to have a, uh, a visual representation of it, right? Um, that's really uh, so contemporary events. Uh, there is a print that she did that's very interesting because uh, I, I didn't bring it here, but it's a uh, it's, a, it's on the Hudson, it's a, it's a, a steamboat picture, a landscape of two steamboats on the Hudson, but it, it's a, instead of representing like a race, like on the Mississippi, it actually represents a ship that had been either retired or, um, or burned. I don't, so it's not a disaster print because it's represented after the fact, but it sort of uh, is a bit nostalgic. Um, it's... Um, uh, uh, it's, it's a ship that was particularly famous because it was a particularly luxury type of ship and that during its lifetime it had a uh, sort of fame and it was no longer there and so she represented it on the Hudson in the past with this a bit of a nostalgic uh, longing uh, feeling for it. It's a, no it's a nocturne scene but it doesn't have, it's very quiet, very different from the uh, Mississippi scene. That it's a difficult question to answer because, of course, today we project a lot of nostalgia onto Courier and I've scenes. Um, but, you know, and, and the architecture that she drew that looks old fashioned to us was modernism in its day. But at the same time, there does seem to be a certain kind of nostalgic feeling that's built into uh, so much of, of her work and so much of Courier and Ives' work. It's like they uh, anticipated that nostalgia and were, and were creating it at the time and to some degree. I think there's a lot of desire, right? Uh, when you look at a uh, still life like that, it's so opulent and rich. And uh, at the same time, uh, it gives a sense of fulfillment and happiness. So in fact, the 19th century was probably, a la per I mean, you know, it's always, I don't know, but there was a lot of struggle for a lot of people. There was a lot of uh, uh, irregularities on the, uh, on the, in the economy, uh, panics, uh, you know, like the panic of 1837. And I, there's like one that's come all, all the time. Um, so yeah, maybe uh, Kiriana has wanted a representation in some ways of at an, an ideal America. Uh, maybe an America that should be rather than an America that was like. Uh, um. Um, so Tom uh, also followed up with a question asking if Fanny's representations of society and women change over time. Have you noticed that? Uh, repeat. So if Fanny, if oh the represent if Fanny. Yeah of women changed. Mm -hmm. hmm. I don't know. Um, because yeah, her prints... Interesting question, but yeah. now you have to go back and look at it from that viewpoint, probably. And I think then we should look at the genre scene, maybe. Mm -hmm. And her genre scenes are, at least as, you know, but again, I would like to look at the book uh, to look at them one, you know, one by one with this specific question in mind. Um, right. I don't see, let's say, 
I, I see gender roles pretty much uh, Victorian gender roles enacted in those scenes. But maybe looking, I don't know if we're looking at it with a, that question in mind, we would start thinking and, and look at, find, you know, subtle hints of something else. Um, Good point. Um, so Marshall's asking, what are the sizes of the original lithographs by Farmer? Um, were they large? Um, or was she using very fine nibs um, to achieve those details in architecture? So uh, the, the uh, print that she published before Curian Eyes, you have all different kinds of sizes. Some of them are gonna be this, this small. I think they were producing anything they could, right? Um, with her husband, uh, because, you know, every commission is money, right? And um, so you find this, like the, the forget-me-not picture is about this big. But uh, the um, Church of the Holy Trinity is a large one. And I'm sorry, I'm, not, I'm terrible with inches. Uh, I was brought up in the... In the uh, centimeters. So uh, it's going to be, let's say, the church is going to be maybe 15 to 20 inches in width and 30 to 40 inches in height. That's kind of what I can get to. Uh, yeah. So very large framing pictures to uh, almost like ephemera. She was producing advertisements, uh, cartoons as well. Um, her cartoons from the early period are interesting because, again, right, we don't know what kind of political uh, mindset she had. Um, and once she, she never, she didn't produce any cartoons for Curian Eyes. Um, Ellen is asking about the beautiful print behind you, and I know I rushed you through that, so. <laughs> Oh, that's, um, uh, that's a still life uh, she produced. Uh, the image itself is from the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And um, uh, it's, it's a beautiful still life. It's one of the, uh, I think, one of her most beautiful compositions. And um, I also find it super interesting that even though, you know, as I said, like, it's not like everybody is going to know about Fanny Palmer. But at the same time, when you think about her work, it's in all the major museum collections. You'll find it at the Philadelphia Museum of Art, you'll find it at the Met, you'll find it uh, uh, in all the major fine art museum uh, in the United States. So it's revealing. Um, yeah, it sure, sure is. Um, let's see. Oh, uh, Dyke Benjamin has an interesting question. Was Fanny Palmer influenced by the art and architectural theories of John Ruskin? Huh, that's a very interesting question, which unfortunately uh, I, I can't answer one way or another because uh, at least I can't, I can't answer it, I think, uh, from, from archival evidence. We, apart, as I said, we have interviews done in the 1920s with people who had actually like the last surviving artist who worked for the firm and people who had known her like you know children of Ives, children of uh, uh, Currier etc and then we have this one little interview uh, I mean which is like two pages long and there's a lot in it but um, and uh, and that's it so I'm assuming that she was reading a lot and um, she was educated she had asked, she, she uh, um, so I, I'm thinking she might totally have read the, you know, uh, Ruskin's book on architecture, but whether it's, yeah. But it's not documented anywhere. No. Thank you. Um, were, Holly's asking, how many impressions of these tinted lithographs could be um, printed? Would each impression be identical to another? Well, that's another uh, uh, very interesting question and something that, um, so uh, we do know something about that. Um, we, from, an, from the interview given by the last surviving artist, Louis Maurer, who's, um, uh, whose tools at the RID American Antiquarian Society, it's uh, super cool to see them. 
uh, anyway, so he said that the very large lithographs were printed and on demand uh, by uh, Charles Courier, who was the brother of Nathaniel Courier, and who worked with, uh, uh, with uh, Fanny Palmer um, on inventing new crayons and stuff like that. So I'm thinking also, I'm wondering if he learned also the printing, the tint printing technique from her and her husband again, right? Um, so if they were printed on demand, because I think that those were sort of experimental in many ways. Um, they were printed on demand. They were not colored in the factory. They were colored in artists' homes. And so because they were colored in artists' homes, they are not always colored exactly the same way. Um, I haven't had the opportunity, I would love to do that at some point, uh, to have like uh, several copies of the same exact print um, to analyze the different pigments, to know whether, you know, like, it's, because we don't know something. We don't, we don't know, for example, if was Curie and I furnishing the inks uh, because, so that I'm sure they would produce a model to, you know, like, oh, this is to be colored that way. Um, but there are variations. And we know that, let's say, they were printed on a long period of time because I've had the opportunity to compare uh, prints sometimes from um and they, they show a bit different like they should let's say something happened to the stone and you see that the stone was broken at some point and so uh and that can happen if you keep that stone for for decades um and we also analyze the papers and for example for in one of uh so like the series that uh, the winter to collection has from 1852 one of the print in the series is printed on a paper uh, that's primarily wood pulp, which is totally different from the high-end lithographic paper that the other ones are printed on. And the paper like that was produced only after 1870. So we know that the paper was different, that it was produced later. So the, the stone remained there, right, for uh, all these years. Um, and so, but we need to go further basically in, 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 uh, in the analysis to see. So there are slight variations. And also you have some lithographic uh, pictures that were painted much later. Uh, we have one at uh, Winter Tour. Uh, it's a still life and I, I, I don't remember if it's by Palmer or not, but basically you can tell though because the um, the technique of watercoloring is totally different. And then we analyzed the pigments and we found a pigment that was from the 1920s. So obviously uh, painted much later. Interesting, thank you. Um, Mike is asking, uh, he says, I've heard that Palmer was weak at drawing and painting people. Do you agree? Well, actually I don't. <laughs> <laughs> I, w I would say the the figures in that the the domestic scene that you showed were quite good. I thought. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I so that comes from uh, from the Harry Peters books from the nineteen thirties. Uh, that's where that uh, the first time, um, or that comes from the interview with Lou, Louis Maurer. I don't know. Uh, I don't. I mean, you know, like uh, my uh, memory is maybe mixing the two, but it comes relatively early uh, in, the, in the literature on Palmer. And I do think that they had to find a weakness one way or another, because I don't see these figures being, they are relatively tiny, uh, so they are not uh, super detailed, but I don't see them as being worse than the figures found in other uh, uh, Korean life pictures. She did some portraits also. She did some, uh, let me think, she did some portraits, of, like I see some portraits of dogs that are beautiful, uh, very large. Um, some portraits of people, I, um, I don't There's remember. There's at least a few in the book, I yeah. Am? She did a few portraits, huh. yeah. You see, I don't remember. I should look again at the book. I, I'm, you know, I'm working from home and the book is, uh, is at the office. <laughs> so I haven't looked at it in like three months. So um, a couple of people, Karen and Anna, are asking whether she had children, child care responsibilities. Um. Yeah, she did. Uh, she had two children, a boy and a girl, uh, about two years apart um, before she uh, emigrated to America. And uh, she also had um, a sister and a brother 
and they all uh, so and I think they they were quite close um, I think the, her brother um, trained in photography if I remember well but again like I'm not 100% sure on, he lived in Manhattan at some point because I found him I think in one of the censuses in Manhattan um, and so her hus her sister did not marry um, let me, is that right? Let me think. Because, well, she had a niece, so maybe her brother married and had children. I, so definitely her sister, I think, did not marry because she, her last name is Bond, which is her, her uh, uh, name before she got married. And so I'm thinking the sister lived with her for a very long time. So I'm assuming that they share responsibilities because, you know, uh, her sister was also uh, an artist, um, but not as professionally involved. Uh, the sister also, they both exhibited at the Mechanic Institute Fairs in New York. Um, but as I said, I don't think the, her sister was as involved uh, in the visual arts uh, as she was. So I imagine they shared responsibilities and they must have hired, uh, you know, nannies and because how do you do it right I mean, we well, know we, we all know what it is right now you put the children to work in, in the printing uh, firm if uh, it would be one way to handle them uh i think also her daughter got married at some point yes uh i i, I definitely need to reread the charlotte's book to get those details but you'll find them all in charlotte's book so right if you right um so uh i think we that about wraps up the questions but i noticed that um courtney uh in in the uh chat is talking about how it seems around that time it was more common for women with artistic ambitions to be trained as wood engravers rather than lithographers um no oh, that's an interesting comment yeah, she um, said that there was a, in London, a female school of design um, and run by an artist named also Fanny, Fanny McGeehan. Hmm. I'll have to look her up. That's super interesting. Right. That right. is interesting. I, I haven't run into that before either, but it's a interesting. There was a huge uh, market for wood engravers as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, wood, en wood engraving is a, a huge uh, portion of the printing industry at that time. Yeah. Um, it's a slightly different market, right? Because it's for uh, uh, book illustrations or uh, newspaper illustrations. Um, whereas like curry and knife prints are largely framing prints, right? whether you frame them or not, you didn't have to frame them obviously, but they were. Um, so I have, a, I have a final process. question uh, yeah. for you, uh, Stephanie. Do you think that uh, Courier and Ives and Fanny Palmer, do you think they had an, uh, uh, an ideology or a, you know, a political or social uh, angle to their work in any way? Well, so that's a, a, a question, let's say, yes and no, I think. Um, so they wanted to have the widest, pop, uh, widest audience possible because, uh, and that goes back to another question, once you have a lithographic uh, uh, stone that has an image, you can print thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of copies. Um, and uh, unless something happens to the stone, basically. And you can also transfer the image on, from one stone on another stone, which they did. Um, so you so that you can speed uh, uh, speed uh, production, right? Um, these are called like mother stone and daughter stones. Um, so they, if you want to reach the widest possible audience, your images have to be able to cater to diff audiences that have different political opinions. Um, so in that sense, I think uh, I don't think that Korean eyes were wanted to express a particular political bias. I don't think so. I think they would want to do uh, prints for Democrat audiences, let's say, and print for Republican audiences in the 1860s. Um, that said, I would say at the same time, when you look at the production broadly, uh, I do think that the values the, that are represented in, um, uh, in the production of Korean Ives really, I said, broadly reflect 
I would say, uh, white Protestant middle class uh, views of the world, if you will. Um, so in that sense, they had a particular um, ideological background, if you will. Thank you. And, and thank you to both of you for this wonderful discussion. And uh, thank you, Stephanie, for um, sharing all those beautiful images with us to help us see Fanny's work even better. And thanks to everybody who tuned in today. Have a great weekend. Thank you. Thank you for thank having you, thank me. Thank you, Angela. It was a pleasure. Bye, everybody. Thank you, Angela. Thank you, Clayton. Bye-bye.